Uh, I am so pleased to be here and it's really an honor to, to kickstart uh, your seminar thanks to the kind invitation of well, all of you, but most of all, uh, Clement, uh, to, with whom I have the pleasure of working closely within the uh, uh, Center for Internet and Society uh, of CNRS. Uh, so, um, this is about uh, mostly a, a research agenda, but it also draws from stuff I've been doing in the past uh, few years. So it's mostly at a conversational stage, which I'm trying to, uh, well, I'm trying to carry on these conversations uh, where, where I can, because I have the feeling that uh, it will mostly be about uh, uh, networking and collaborations that uh, a research pro program can happen on, on this in the, in the close future. Uh, and I would like to mention that uh, I've been uh, uh, reflecting closely on, on these issues with uh, already with a number of people and uh, mostly with uh, Julia uh, Pole, uh, who uh, uh, well has been working on digital sovereignty for uh, much longer than I. <laughs> and uh, uh, well, to, uh, to our conversations, I'm bringing a little bit this infrastructure in perspective, which I will be uh, talking about. And I'm going to also start my 20 minutes, uh, 19 by now. Uh, so uh, just as a short introduction, uh, an example. So uh, most of, uh, uh, of you have probably uh, heard uh, of, uh, uh, of this, uh, this example already. Uh, so Gaia X is this uh, project of a sovereign European cloud uh, that has been going on for uh, the, past, uh, the past few years now. Uh, and uh, uh, so there is a, uh, it aims at representing the next generation of data infrastructure. It aims to be uh, stakeholder, uh, multi-stakeholder. It, uh, it's supposed to be um, based on a decentralized architecture, so that there are a lot of um, interesting things uh, going on with this with this project. And the reason why I chose it is also uh, this: uh, that it is also controversial. That is to say that. <clears throat> Uh, beyond this uh, this particular well set of uh, features that is listed uh, as a, uh, the ideal way to go about uh, a European sovereign cloud, uh, there is also um, a number of uh, of controversies about uh, uh, who should be in it and uh, how it should be uh, regulated. And in particular, uh, in uh, in the past year, there has been a lot of controversy about whether uh, Palantir uh, should uh, should join its board of uh, of directors. Uh, so uh, be, I, this example seems very interesting to me because uh, uh, there is also like a, a, a number of ways in which uh, we can unveil uh, what uh, what are the alliances and uh, uh, and the, um, the organizations that are uh, envisaged for uh, a sovereign infrastructure especially when it comes to a supranational entity like Europe. Uh, and uh, uh, so I hope that uh, uh, Gaia X can be uh, thoroughly studied uh, in, the, in the close future uh, in this and other respects. So what this case and others show is that uh, digital infrastructures materialize uh, a lot of things. Uh, in, they materialize sovereignty, they materialize a certain conception of uh, uh, territories, um, they materialize uh, institutions, both national and supranational. They materialize the way in which these institutions uh, are collaborating with uh, uh, the private sector. So all of this is uh, co-produced by, uh, by digital infrastructures. Um, so uh, digital sovereignty uh, is understood uh, primarily so far as a, as a legal concept and as a set of uh, political discourses. And as such, there has been, uh, especially when uh, in efforts to, to define it, uh, there has been a, a predominance of uh, uh, disciplines such as political science, international relations and international law. Uh, and it seems to me that there is another angle, uh, interesting angle through which uh, one could study digital sovereignty. Uh, it is a, an STS inspired angle. Uh, so to study dig digital sovereignty as a set of infrastructures and social material practices. And it seems to me that so far there has been less ground covered in this regard than uh, uh, in other disciplinary perspectives. Uh, so um, I'm trying to figure out what could be our research agenda to fill this gap and uh, to, uh, to figure out what is uh, what a perspective grounded in SDS and more specifically in infrastructure studies could bring. Uh, so uh, 
let us ask a bit what, how can the concept of digital sovereignty be studied via uh, a number of situated practices, so practices that can be linked to a particular territory, to a particular set of actors, to a particular time and place, uh, and embedded in infrastructures that uh, seek to establish strategic autonomy or independence or sovereignty in, in a world that is otherwise uh, uh, hyper-connected. Uh, so apart from uh, outlining uh, an agenda to study this, I will, I will focus briefly on, uh, uh, on Russia, uh, not only because uh, it is a heavily current news right now, but also because uh, before the current news, we have been studying it in a, a research project funded by the French uh, National Agency for Research called Resistic uh, for the past uh, five years now. Uh, so, um, I, uh, when I try to make sense of this, uh, like of the digital sovereignty concept or set of concepts uh, uh, via uh, an, an infrastructure perspective, uh, I, I have reflected uh, mostly on three uh, strands uh, of literature that uh, can, uh, can be, uh, we can work towards uh, merging. So uh, the first is the, is the set of, uh, internet governance studies uh, coming from several di disciplines, but mostly from the law and political science uh, that have studied uh, sovereignty and digital sovereignty as a subset of it and uh, um, state transformations. The second strand of literature is uh, um, uh, of uh, uh, science and technology studies inspiration, uh, more precisely infrastructure studies, and it's about how uh, networked information systems have been uh, have been studied uh, via this perspective over over the years. And the, the third one, uh, which is a, a, a a subset of, of this STS uh, big world of studying infrastructures uh, is, uh, is what uh, we have called with uh, Laura Denardis, Derek Coburn, and uh, Nanette Levinson in a 2016 uh, edited volume, the term to infrastructure in internet governance. That is to say, uh, the extent to which um, actors uh, coming from, uh, from the private sector, from uh, institutions, uh, for hybrids of it, uh, are uh, using and sometimes co-opting uh, specific components of internet infrastructure for uh, political objectives that are very varied and uh, uh, for the most part uh, are not the objectives that these uh, infrastructures were originally intended for. Uh, so um, I will not uh, dwell more on this uh, uh, on this literature for uh, lack of time in the present format, but we can come back to uh, to them perhaps a little bit more in the discussion uh, and uh, uh, offline afterwards if you wish. Um, so uh, what I uh, what I try to do with this perspective of infrastructure and digital sovereignty is to elaborate on this uh, these different strands of work. Uh, observing that uh, the, that states uh, and also other actors that pursue these strategies of autonomization, independence, sovereignization, and sometimes even isolation of their national internets, Russia comes to mind again, uh, they are often engaged in these uh, politicized uses of uh, and the co-optations uh, of internet infrastructure, which also carries some associated risks uh, alongside opportunities for these actors. Uh, so, um, to, uh, as far as I see it, uh, to, uh, to see how strategies of uh, digital sovereignty get inscribed in infrastructures and uh, uh, to understand what, uh, what this reveals of how institutions, territories, um, stakeholders are transformed, there are two uh, scholarly gestures that seem desirable. The first uh, is to uh, follow uh, those arrangements that are grounded in digital, in digital infrastructures where sovereignty, uh, digital sovereignty as a foundational principle is uh, either promised, intended, constructed or co-opted. And the second gesture is to really zoom in methodologically on the technical components of digital infrastructure and see them as uh, uh, sites uh, where uh, we can trace uh, particular visions of sovereignty and how they are inscribed in those sites. Uh, more specifically, uh, the idea is to examine how uh, the digital sovereignty label becomes instantiated in a number of uh, infrastructures of control, 
uh, either macro or micro, uh, and how uh, actors, uh, the diverse actors of the internet seek to co-op them as proxies on their authority and how this in return reshapes what they are and uh, where they operate. Uh, identifying and analyzing situations where uh, internet infrastructures uh, do something, that is to say, they are not instruments of something, uh, but they are uh, part of the mediation of uh, translating uh, the management of technical control points into particular definitions uh, of digital sovereignty. Uh, so to go to the uh, to my second part uh, and uh, uh, our ongoing uh, pilot case uh, within the Resistic project. Uh, so we, we are looking, uh, we've been looking for a few years now uh, on how uh, Russia infrastructures its, uh, its digital sovereignty. Um, so why is Russia interesting? Because it's, uh, uh, it's a specific case and at the same time a laboratory of uh, uh, things that are happening worldwide. So uh, in the first uh, decade of the 21st century, there have been relatively high levels of freedom uh, uh, in digital innovation and in internet use in, in Russia. Uh, however, uh, in the past decade or so, there have been increasingly strict regulations imposed by the government uh, and uh, there has been a number of um, um, laws, um, including the 2019 Sovereign Internet Law, 2020 um, Law Against Apple, uh, an official name uh, to, to, to say that uh, um, it, is a, it is a law that um, uh, stipulates that uh, um, all uh, devices, uh, computing devices in Russia should uh, carry on a pre-loaded uh, uh, set of uh, uh, Russian-made uh, apps. Uh, and so politically speaking, in particular, there has been an evolving and a, a very broadly increased role of Roskomnadzor, which is the uh, media and communication watchdog in, in Russia. Uh, all of this has led to a Russia-specific instantiation of the digital sovereignty uh, label that carries on a complex dialectic of law and infrastructure-based enforcement uh, aimed at countering foreign influences and agents as well as their devices and applications. And the two uh, um, legal instruments I just talked about are prime examples of this. Uh, so this is our uh, project uh, uh, website, which is uh, mostly in French, but not only. Uh, so in this project, we have tried to analyze how different actors of the RUNET have coped with this uh, relatively sudden uh, strengthening uh, of uh, constraints uh, over the national internet. And uh, we have had a particular focus on uh, a number of online resistance practices uh, and techniques uh, for circumventing online constraints. Uh, this is uh, perhaps the, the most uh, like complete publication that has come out so far out of the project. Uh, there are others in progress. It is a, a first Monday special issue uh, co-edited by Francoise Dossé and myself, uh, in which we have examined uh, uh, an infrastructure-based sociology of RUNET in a number of uh, fieldwork sites, including controversies around uh, the secure messaging app uh, Telegram, um, controversies surrounding the Yandex news aggregator. This is the uh, Yandex is the equivalent of Google in, in Russia. Uh, the paradox related to the use of uh, uh, the Google suite uh, of services uh, in Russia that actually sees uh, several Russian NGOs considering uh, internet giants and uh, in particular Google as a protector of their uh, civil liberties as one of the few actors that can stand up to the government actually. Um, and uh, also there is an article on uh, uh, shadow mass literature online libraries which have been made illegal uh, in the early uh, 2010s uh, and uh, have uh, uh, prompted uh, in, in practice particular definitions of uh, freedom and, uh, and circumvention. Uh, so there, there have been uh, four uh, recurring dynamics which we have observed throughout all these, uh, uh, all these case studies. Uh, the first is that the Russian government uh, wants to raise a series of obstacles, both legal and material, against uh, foreign techniques and alternative infrastructures that are considered as, as a subversive and foreign agents, as we, as we mentioned. Um, the second is that mo most often these coercive measures engender collateral damage 
that is uh, uh, that damages infrastructures for the most part, and uh, uh, this generates attempts to remedy or mitigate this collateral damage in uh, in ways that are often infrastructure based themselves. Um, new uh, digital national champions are developed uh, under increased, uh, increasingly close government supervision. Uh, on one hand, this leads to pressures and manipulations exerted by the states on particular platforms. And, on, uh, and it also leads to counter moves that can really be surprising from the standpoint of uh, Europe-based or US-based scholars, such as, for example, this trust in American net giants that I, I previously mentioned. And uh, uh, the, the fourth uh, dynamic we saw is that uh, critique and circumvention initiatives emerge among internet users vis-a-vis uh, -vis this governance by infrastructure. And these reactions contribute to the emergence of new forms of resistance uh, by infrastructure. So of course, this has all been turned upside down. <laughs> Uh, by the Russia-Ukraine uh, war and uh, invasion uh, uh, of, uh, of Ukraine by the Russian Federation armies. Uh, and uh, we are trying to make sense uh, of it as, the, as there are uh, several uh, very important uh, things that are happening, both in terms of uh, uh, private sector actors leading, uh, sorry, leaving Russian territory, uh, new forms of resistance taking place both uh, inside and, uh, and outside of Russia uh, and so on. So most likely uh, the final months of the project uh, and uh, certainly whatever comes after it will be uh, devoted to, uh, to keep on making sense of what's going on uh, in this field. In this talk, uh, so to, to conclude, uh, I have tried to so make a case in Atlan an, an agenda for studying the concept of uh, digital sovereignty via these uh, situated practices that are uh, infrastructure embedded uh, and uh, within uh, a world that is hyper-connected, try to establish autonomous digital infrastructures. Uh, and uh, uh, this is again a call for uh, a research program, program in the years to come. Um, in this notion of infrastructure and digital sovereignty, uh, there are uh, both uh, sociological processes, uh, authors, uh, actors uh, keep on organizing, acting towards uh, political goals, uh, but there are also activities of uh, interpretation and definition, so remaking really sense of notions such as sovereignty, such as territory, such as institution. Uh, and uh, a number of social technical pra practices in as much as internet infrastructures uh, are handled, are managed as uh, uh, key mediators of what's happening in the digital sphere. Um, you can to skip this. Uh, so uh, apart from this uh, STS oriented perspective that I, um, that I outlined, uh, I think that there is a need of close dialogue with uh, uh, of course, the, the classical uh, disciplines that have tackled this notion of sovereignty, such as uh, political science, international relations, and international law, uh, that have a long history of uh, exploring uh, the erosion and the reaffirmation of state authority as the, they relate to, to the internet and digital technologies, uh, but also uh, for the surveillance studies, uh, arrangements of power are really enacted to, through a number of technical devices and systems that have generally uh, surveillance goals or uh, protecting from it. And also um, political geography, because uh, uh, there, has, there is a set of uh, very interesting uh, work uh, and uh, methodological tools uh, that help to uh, conceptualize space uh, as it is embodied by, by digital infrastructure. Uh, so the, the quest for digital self-determination is uh, really likely to be a central geopolitical issue in, in the coming uh, decade. Uh, on one hand, because uh, uh, there are actors, both uh, public and private uh, or uh, uh, consortia of it, <laughs> uh, that are making a case that digital sovereignty is really necessary to, uh, to protect some fundamental societal goods uh, from cultural to economic prosperity. Uh, and uh, there are things that are uh, coming uh, already there, but uh, increasingly so, uh, such as artificial intelligence or the Internet of Things uh, that uh, uh, make it so that uh, this concept is probably uh, going to acquire even greater relevance in, in the coming years. 
Uh, and so it seems to me that the systemic transformations that are brought about by this digital sovereignty wave, <laughs> which uh, a lot of uh, institutions and uh, other actors talk about worldwide, uh, there is a gain to, <laughs> to be uh, obtained in addressing it as a sets of practices of social ordering that are really intimately linked to how humans uh, and organizations build, develop, use, co-opt, and resist uh, digital infrastructures. Uh, so I have published a, a programmatic uh, article uh, that uh, uh, is about uh, very much about this talk uh, in uh, the uh, Association for Internet Researchers uh, special issue uh, of, uh, of this year. Edit by Fracker and Andrew Liadis. And this is my miniature. Uh, and uh, so I'm happy to, to discuss further the, the paper with uh, whoever is interested. And uh, let's start uh, in just a bit. And uh, here's where to find me uh, when this talk is over. Thank you so much. Many thanks, Francesca, for this very thought-provoking and indeed very timely presentation, as you also mentioned. Uh, I'm sure a lot of the angles, uh, especially in the context of the war going on in Ukraine, uh, are going to come up in the discussion. But before we go to the Q&A, I would like to pass the floor to Jamal Shayan, who has kindly agreed to act as discussant uh, for this session. So Jamal, please, the floor is yours. Thanks, uh, Orshi, um, and thanks, Orshi and Clément, for organizing this, and thanks, Francesca, for making a, 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 a timely, uh, timed, well-timed, and um, a very stimulating uh, presentation that will um, uh, hopefully gather a lot of discussion in the uh, Q and A. Um, <clears throat> but I'll, I'll. I'll try and start the ball rolling with some, some comments uh, from my side. Uh, traditionally, a discussant uh, discusses a paper before it's published, but this one, uh, so I'll only focus on the compliments um, uh, on this, <laughs> for this paper um, and go into some questions at the end, Francesca, that maybe would be uh, useful for us to um, uh, think about in terms of your presentation. Um, digital sovereignty is a concept that's been bothering me for about a year or so now. Um, um, we've tried to um, um, put down in, in terms of the different stakeholders uh, approaches to understanding what we actually mean by this term, because it's a term that everybody appears to agree on. Um, oh, yes, we have to act in, in a way that uh, in, encourages digital sovereignty. But then you actually say, if everybody agrees on this term, what do they actually mean by it? We find that there are lots of um, um, not misunderstandings, but there are lots of different understandings that come out um, as you start talking to people. And Francesca, what, what you did in the paper that I read, um, which is really nice, is lays out some of these different strands, as you mentioned um, uh, in your text. Um, there's also some other work that's been done by Julia. Uh, you mentioned Julia Paul, I think you've worked with, um, Daniel Lambach and others that have really been looking at how digital sovereignty is actually being used um, in, in, in terms of how people really interpret what they're meaning when they say that. Um, and I think it's, uh, and I'm going to congratulate you for um, actually making this kind of call for interdisciplinarity in this approach. Um, this is something that um, political scientists see the word sovereignty and they go, that's mine, right? That's my cheese. Um, or legal scholars do the same. Um, other um, maybe more practically oriented scholars might say, well, it mentions digital, so this is about technical issues. Um, and they never seem, they seem to put these two words in opposition, digital sovereignty, but in fact, in practice, they're used in policy and in, and in development of meaning um, um, uh, in, a, in a different way. And I really like this idea of looking towards STS. It's a logical place. Um, to actually get inspired for this work. Um, but I'm going to tease you a bit on that point, because um, <clears throat> when it comes to the concept of sovereignty, um, when I think about sovereignty as uh, somebody who's been trained in international relations, I tend to think um, about 
control. And I tend to think about absolutes, but I also tend to think about um, infrastructures all over. So states for me are about infrastructure, right? whether it's your roads, whether it's your health system, whether it's your taxing system. Um, for me, a state is infrastructure. Right? So there I would, I would actually kind of say, well, you know, th this is part and parcel of quite a lot of the debates already. Right? Another side of that, uh, and the flip side of that, is that, um, and you referred to some of these texts in your work, um, we talk about the, the digital as being a global commons. <clears throat> and therefore, that, that's kind of a different approach to thinking um, about state sovereignty, right? Um, and looking at digital sovereignty from a commons approach might, might, might give us different, a different kind of angle. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but to me, the opposition there between sovereignty and digital sovereignty um, may lay somewhere within the idea of the commons. Um, I'm also interested in some of the points that you raised. Um, you, your title says digital self-determination, <clears throat> right? And you mention that um, in terms of sovereignty, um, some of the, or in terms of digital sovereignty, some of the literature is now looking not at the state level, but more at the individual level, or looking at how individuals perceive of their, um, um, uh, their capacities to develop themselves as sovereign actors. Um, and I think that that role um, being played out either through um, some texts which you know would claim that individuals have sovereignty in this space or through the role of or the mitigating role of civil society in this space is also very important um, and um, and I don't think that um, you know a story about digital sovereignty that doesn't talk about the role of civil society and maybe how that plays into um, engaging governments in different kind of actions may be interesting uh, to do. Um, you talk about these different boxes of literature, these different strands of literature, right? Um, and I think that what's kind of also important for me, uh, or at least what I what I see is very important for some for some scholars, is that we if you integrate many of the social sciences together in a certain way, there's always the, the, the hard sciences, the people that are actually building the boxes, right, mm -hmm. um, that do not seem to be engaged in these debates. And, and I say this because I was uh, uh, reviewing something earlier on this week, um, where I found that uh, the, the kind of the hard sciences approach to digital sovereignty is completely alien to the approach that we might have you know, even within the broad school of social sciences. And so there I would say that I would like us to go even one step further um, and actually really engage with and encourage um, people in different technical committees, different technical communities to actually engage in different ways. Um, and that's a challenge, that's not easy because they don't see the actual added value of this reflection <laughs> sometimes. Although I know that people like Niels Ten Uvert have been doing that in the context of the IETF um, and other spaces. Um, a third point, I think it's a third point, that you um, um, uh, mentioned um, predominantly in your paper, it's also about this idea of digital sovereignty and its national conceptualization. Right? Um, I was quite intrigued by that because I thought, well, um, sovereignty being related quite intimately to the nation state, right? that um, we now see that there are potentials for sovereignty not to be seen of in terms of the nation state. Right? Um, and it would be interesting to see what alternative conceptions of digital sovereignty might emerge, whether they be supranational, um, um, you know, as in as in the EU or as in other regional organisations, or whether they be subnational or even transnational in certain ways. So, I'd really like um, that kind of discussion to to well, maybe you could uh, also reflect on that point yourself. 
And then I think the fourth and final point that I will make in the one and a half minutes that I have left um, would be about the case. I mean, I'm not an expert in, 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 in the Russian case, um, but I found it really um, um, informative to actually read about your, your case and also the special issue and, and first Monday. Um, but I was wondering if you look, you also mentioned, of course, that many scholars have looked at the Chinese case and so on. Um, but in the European case, um, there's quite a bit going on, I think, in terms of digital sovereignty. Um, and there's quite a bit of reflection on how this plays out at the national level within the European context. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, at the European level, have you had any thoughts about how this concept of digital sovereignty is being framed? It seems to me that there's um, a kind of, uh, if you think of geopolitical narratives, there's this kind of game between um, big powers saying, well, if they're talking about digital sovereignty, then we need to talk about digital sovereignty, but we need to talk about different digital sovereignty in a slightly different way in order to show that our way is the best way. Um, and I was just wondering at the EU level whether you actually saw this being more or less the same game that's emerging um, as per the Russian, as per the, um, um, uh, the, the Chinese games. Um, because you started with Gaia X. Um, one of the things that um, I um, recall from about 14 years ago now was this massive press release made by the, oh, surprise, surprise, the French and the German um, um, Prime Minister, press, um, yeah, heads of state, um, who announced that um, Google would no longer be necessary in Europe because the German and the French ministries were financing something called Quero. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever heard <laughs> of anything about this, but to me, when I hear Gaia X, I feel that I could replace some of this terminology um, with some previous projects that have been played out. Um, and that really just gets me to then the, the, this final point about the EU, um, also um, linking that back to the literature, as I mentioned before. To me, um, some of these stories are repeating stories, right? Um, I mean, Karl Deutsch was talking about the power of communications and, and influencing state interactions and so on. You had uh, people like Monroe Price, um, 20 years ago who are writing books on sovereignty and the media and so on. And so I'm wondering if, you know, part of these stories are not repeating um, and it would be nice also to look transdisciplinarily, but also um, back in time as well. And that would be my call. My call to add to your call. So thank you very much for that very inspiring presentation. And I leave the floor to questions now.